there's a common perception about Italy shared around the world that the country predominantly thrives on tourism, reaping the benefits of its rich history and heritage. Many media outlets often paint Italy with this narrative. But is this entirely true? Not exactly. Logically, no country can become a G7 member solely through tourism. Of course, the tourism industry plays a significant role in Italy's economy. In 2019, before the pandemic hit, tourism accounted for 13.2% of Italy's GDP. The industry supported approximately 3.2 million jobs, from hotels to travel agencies to car rentals. While this percentage is lower than Greece's 20.6% and Spain's 14.6%, it's still noteworthy. Every year, an impressive 62 million tourists visit Italy, surpassing the country's population of 60 million. In terms of global tourism rankings, Italy comes fifth, following France, Spain, the U.S., and China. However, tourism alone can't account for Italy's stature as the world's eighth-largest economy. In the booming 1990s, Italy even surpassed the UK to become the fifth largest global economy. What was the primary driver for this growth? It was manufacturing. Italy has a robust and diversified manufacturing sector. It's Europe's second largest manufacturing powerhouse following Germany and is ahead of both the UK and France. According to UN data, in 2019, Italy accounted for 2.1% of global manufacturing output, ranking seventh globally. Furthermore, 24% of Italy's GDP is generated by its manufacturing sector, employing roughly 30% of its populace. Italy has produced 13 Nobel laureates in physics, chemistry, physiology, or medicine, showcasing its strength in fundamental sciences. The country possesses world-class technical expertise in a plethora of sectors ranging from machinery, chemicals, automobiles, aviation, metals, bicycles, musical instruments, fashion, food, furniture, ceramics to shoes, especially in the fashion industry, with renowned brands like Gucci, Prada, and Armani. Italy undeniably leads the world. More recently, Italy has demonstrated strength in the pharmaceutical sector, becoming Europe's top producer of treatments for Alzheimer's and cancer. A significant portion of Italy's trade occurs within Europe, taking advantage of its central geographical position both on land and sea. When you think of major Italian corporations, what comes to mind? Perhaps Fiat in the auto sector or Benetton in apparel. Interestingly, the unique aspect of Italy's manufacturing scene is its overwhelming number of small to medium-sized enterprises. When listing countries where SMEs significantly support the national economy, Germany, Italy, and Taiwan often come up. Among these, Italy stands out for having companies of relatively smaller scales, but these businesses often have a long-standing history and possess exceptional technical capabilities. Italy is home to about 4.4 million companies. Among these, only about 3,800 are large corporations with over 250 employees. A whopping 95% of all Italian businesses employ fewer than 10 people, and there are 3 million companies with fewer than 5 employees. Hence, the majority of Italians work for these small enterprises. In the U.S., Article I of the Constitution begins with all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. On the other hand, the first article of the Italian Constitution reads, Italy is a democratic republic, founded on labor. This underscores Italy's immense respect for workers' rights. Naturally, businesses are often eager to avoid strong labor unions. However, Italian labor law is quite lenient towards businesses with 15 or fewer employees. They also enjoy tax benefits. This is a big reason why there are so many micro-enterprises in Italy. Even Citerio, a luxury furniture manufacturer reportedly used by Russia's Putin, has a cozy staff of just 12 people. There's a historical context to the prevalence of micro-companies in Italy. The country has only been unified for about 160 years. After the fall of the Roman Empire, Italy remained fractured into numerous city-states for over 1,500 years. Each city-state needed to be self-sufficient, producing their own clothes, shoes, furniture, leather, ceramics, and precious metal goods. Those businesses, once akin to cottage industries, survived post-unification, evolving into the micro-companies we see today. But just having a lot of small businesses doesn't guarantee prosperity, as seen in Italy's case.
There's another secret to Italy's success. Italian micro-enterprises form clusters based on specialty. For instance, Valenza, a small city in northern Italy, is a hub for precious metals. In this city, hundreds of workshops, each with four to five artisans, collaborate on products. Nearly half of the town's 20,000 residents work in the same field, sharing expertise and collectively marketing their products, a tradition over 130 years old. Cremona, a medieval town in north-central Italy, follows a similar model. Hundreds of small workshops collaboratively produce world-famous stringed instruments like the Stradivarius, Guarneri, and Amati. This collaboration has been going on for 300 years. Such clusters are scattered all over Italy, with over 200 of them specializing in different areas. Turin for automobiles, Milan for fashion, Bologna for machinery, Verona for shoes, and Genoa for shipbuilding are some of the prominent clusters. Cooperating within these clusters allows small and medium-sized enterprises to engage in research and development and achieve economies of scale. They can also reduce production costs through joint production. Thanks to this approach, Italian micro-enterprises have transformed into strong small enterprises, producing premium made-in-Italy goods in their respective fields. However, since the 2000s, the limitations of these cluster-oriented strong small enterprises have become evident. No matter how much they collaborate, it's challenging to realize the economies of scale that large corporations achieve. Consequently, Italian companies have been losing price competitiveness in the global market. Despite their artisanal dedication to quality, they increasingly lag behind global standards. Sometimes, this artisanal spirit can hinder rapid responses to market changes. Since most Italian micro-enterprises are family businesses, their productivity is among the lowest in the EU. Young individuals without a family business find it almost impossible to get jobs, and those inheriting family businesses have extremely low college attendance rates. It's telling that many in Italy prefix their names with dot, signifying a college degree. Due to these issues, the Italian economy has been stagnant since the 2000s. As of 2021, while the U.S. has a per capita income of $70,248, Italy stands at $35,657, showing minimal growth. In many respects, Italy faces numerous challenges, making one question if its G7 status is fitting. The country is infamous for its bureaucratic mess, pervasive tax evasion, and corruption. The underground economy, including mafia activities, accounts for 12% of Italy's GDP. The national debt exceeds 150%, and youth unemployment has at times soared to almost 35%. Given the low education levels, meager foreign investments, low labor productivity, and significant economic disparities between the North and South, Italy's future seems bleak. Yet Italy's economic crisis isn't a recent development. Thirty years ago, international media were warning of Italy's precarious position. However, Italy has held its spot in the G7 against all odds, often likened to the Leaning Tower of Pisa's economy. Since its construction in the 13th century, the Leaning Tower of Pisa began tilting and has seemed on the brink of collapsing but has persisted, much like Italy's economy. In the end, it remains to be seen whether other nations will soon outpace Italy, or if, like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, the Italian economy will continue to endure.